Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast. And our guest today um, is from Long Island and has written a book which takes place on Long Island. And it is a horror story. So uh, please tell us about yourself and about the book, Good Neighbors. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Sarah Langan. It's so nice to meet you. I'm so glad to be here. And yeah, I grew up on Long Island uh, in a town called Garden City. And um, I set the book, Good Neighbors, in this fictionalized version of Garden City. Um, and in this fictionalized version, this family called the Wild Family, uh, who come from not much. Uh, they, they both have abusive histories, the parents, and they've sort of scrimped and saved and don't have college degrees and are in East New York, but their dream is to buy this piece of the American dream and to move to this cul-de-sac in Garden City. And so they save everything they have for the most rundown house so that they can send their kids to the good school and they can fit and they can give their kids what they never had. And they're not welcomed because um, it's set in the near future. And my idea was that, um, pretty soon we're gonna be feeling the, the scarcity and the, the general economic decline caused by global warming. And so I wanted my characters who were middle-class and upper middle-class to be sort of circling their wagons at the beginning of the story. So what happens is uh, they're perceived as an indication that the entire town is in decline if they can afford the buy-in. And uh, then this sinkhole caused by global warming opens in the middle of the cul-de-sac and the child of the queen bee of the block falls inside. And in order to distract attention from what she has done, this queen bee, she concocts a plan to blame the wild family for her daughter's disappearance. And the town and this, this block is uh, receptive to it because they're all looking for a scapegoat. And so really the story is about scapegoating. And I, and I based it on, um, there's this episode of the Twilight Zone called The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. And I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about the play Our Town and also Dogville. And I think there's this intersection. I think Von Trier's was really commenting on, on Our Town with Dogville. Um, and I was kind of looking for that, that place in between. So, so that's the story. Um, yeah, it was, it was done very well. And I think right away as a fan of Twilight Zone, I picked up on the monsters are due on Maple Street um, immediately. And now that you've mentioned um, the other inspirations, it's kind of coming to me as well. Um, and I like, there, there were a few other things that came to mind while I was reading it, but I like how you have a map of the different houses and who lives in the houses um, throughout the book, and you can kind of see how things change as the situations escalate. Um, yeah, so yeah. like I think I think Simon and Schuster, they were so supportive, but they must have wanted to kill me by the end because I can't draw. And I was like, we need some maps. <laughs> and I like made up these terrible maps. So they had to hire somebody and like and this whole thing. So I'm so glad they did it because I think the book really needed a map because when you look at it, it's um it's also about abandonment because when the sinkhole opens, it's toxic fumes. And so half the block is like, yeah, I have some money. I'm getting out. And they all just move, you know, <laughs> they're gone. And so it's about the people who are stuck behind and the kinds of anxieties that they're feeling. Yeah, I definitely um, found that very helpful. And another thing that comes up in the story because part of it is told from the future of the future 
is how society and pop culture related to what happened there. Um, it's pretty early on you realize they're referring to something really, really terrible happened in that neighborhood. And you hear about plays and about commentaries and books. And it's, um, you know, with the, I think the true crime obsession, it worked really well to kind of frame the idea that things were going to get really, really bad, but you didn't 100% know how and really who the victims were going to be. Yeah, I wanted some suspense. You know, I wanted to, and I think also I didn't know myself because there's a different story. If I had chosen different people to be murdered by the end of the book, it's a completely different novel. And so I was kind of deciding who I was as a writer and, and what the story I was telling was. So I think, I think, I think, you know, by the end, but it's also just fun suspense. The Wilds. So uh, the father, he had apparently, he was a rock star at one point. Um, did you, so the name Wild, I mean, clearly that's a wonderful name for a rock star. <laughs> um, how did you pick it and how did you decide that that was going to be his base story? Oh, you know, I, I had originally thought of naming it the Wilds of Long Island. And I just thought that's, you know, a good last name for it, right? Um, but I think with Arlo, um, you know, I spent a lot of time in the East Village. You know, I grew up in Long Island and then you moved to New York and so I was living in the East Village. And there were just so many junkies uh, when I was there. And they were mostly like has been rock stars or could have been rock stars. And I was thinking about, in, in, in Arlo's story, this is the dad of the Wild family and he's got, you know, tattoo sleeves to cover up all the track marks. Um, I was thinking about someone, a failed musician being tasked with raising a son with more talent than him in the East Village and the failed musician is a junkie. So in my mind, like Arlo was raised by his dad in like a, a literal squat but had an enormous amount of talent. And his backstory, you get in pieces, but to me what happened was that he actually was um, the talent and the creative ability behind his band that he forms in his teens. And they have a hit and his dad immediately signs on as his manager, steals on the money and intentionally gets him addicted because he's so jealous. And like, it's the theme, this isn't, you know, as I say, this is a very side story. This isn't, you know, good neighbors, there's a lot of redeeming characters too. But one of the themes I wanted to talk about was this notion of parents and their responsibilities to their children and intentional and unintentional harm caused. Because, you know, there's, there's a sinkhole on my block that, that happened after good neighbors. Um, and, it's caused by global warming and the kind of the kinds of the effects that we're having on our children's futures. And these stories that we've been telling, especially in pop culture, about how if we just raise our kids to be good kids and take them to soccer games and do this like this middle class aspirational idea of what's appropriate child rearing, everything's gonna be okay and our kids will solve global warming. And no, they're not. This is, this is ours to solve. We're still in charge. And it, it galls me, this notion that it's their responsibility. Yeah, I agree. And while you were saying that, I, I, the, the title of another Twilight Zone episode came to mind, Kick the Can, although this is completely different. You know, I think that there seems to be this notion of kicking the can down the street, you know, like, oh, you know, yeah, we're raising the next generation to make the world better. Well, if you're not actively working as um, a middle-aged parent to continue to make the world better, it's, there's going to be no place to kick the can to when it's time for your children to do so. I mean, it's very, it's very upsetting. And there's a lot that you talk about in this book with parents setting um, examples even just like how to treat people for their kids. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted, I wanted the kids to know better. <laughs> you know, the kids are like, 
uh uh like we're not going to be mean to the wild kids because we like them and it's unkind and it's unnecessary to be unkind and there actually are consequences to this unkindness um yeah yeah but it's also this question of like well how will the kids know how to make a better world unless they have any example whatsoever of how to do it other than you know making sure that they're dressed well and their clothes look nice so and they get good have... grades oh yes <laughs> well you know i mean the school districts you're gonna get good, you know you have to not only are you in the best school district but you have to have the best grades to be part of that um yeah <laughs> it's the most bizarre wrong-headed thinking and i'm surrounded by it too in los angeles where it's like is your kid in the gifted program is your kid going to the best possible school and i'm like what does that have to do with anything and how is that going to make their life any better it's it's um it's definitely it's definitely a question uh for sure and um i did i have to say i did like the children a lot in this book um and one question i do have and regarding the family names and the adults um and if i'm way off on this please just say you're way off on this um i noticed you use a lot of names from mythology was yeah. that intentional yeah, the Titans and and eat their the Hestias and Rhea. Yeah. Yeah, got it. Like most, you're like the first one to bring that up ever, and it's been like out for seven months. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm a huge mythology buff myself, and um, while I was reading this, I you know you saw you saw, you, you talk about like things being coincidences and not. I was like, okay, one is a coincidence. Two is, but there were there was more than um, Atlas. Yeah, and... Atlas. I mean, there was just no way that that was a coincidence. So, what made you decide to do that? And I love it. I was just having fun, right? And I was doing the research on there. There are myths we tell ourselves again and again for a reason because it's like part of our nature. This this idea of of what we're giving to our children, the next generation and what we want to give to them. And then I also was thinking of just the sort of um, the oppressiveness. Uh, this is another, this is a side story um, that I was thinking about with, with men, especially. Men with su very successful fathers tend to have a harder time. So I did Peter Benchley and Robert Benchley and I did, you know, Arlo and, um, Woody was his dad's original name, but I don't think it ever comes up. Gun three. Yeah, no, I, I got that. Um, and uh, I, I appreciated that as well. Uh, <laughs> so monsters are due on Maple Street. I mean, I don't really want to talk too much about spoilers because um, I think, I really think that this was such a good book. And it's one of those books, it's definitely horror, but I think it's almost like horror in the way, like there's, the, I felt like there was a lot of satire there, um, you know, and then like the whole idea of just there being a sinkhole in the middle of the neighborhood, even though apparently it's a thing that does happen and <laughs> caused by global warming, but there was, a, there were a lot of um, other things within it. Um, but monsters are doing Maple Street, I think, you know, there are some Twilight Zone episodes that when I watched the Twilight Zone, I was like, that is 100% uh, relevant now. And there are some that don't seem relevant until certain points. For instance, uh, the one, It's a Good Life with Billy Mummy um, as the little boy who could manipulate things. To me, that was not scary until I was pregnant. And then I was like, oh, this is terrifying. <laughs> And then there are some that you know are a product of their time. You know, you're just like, okay, like, why was this scary at the time? Well, you know, let's look at it from when this happened. But there are a lot that are universally just jarring. And I think Monsters Are Due on Maple Street is one that will always be scary because scapegoating is absolutely always a thing that happens. And um, in suburbia, where everything is supposed to be idyllic, um, you know, and people are supposed to be moving into these houses to get a leg up and to have a part of the American dream, 
it happens so much and usually in a quiet way at first. Yeah, I'm actually just looking up the epilogue of Monsters of Dew on Maple Street that um, Sterling says because it's so good. It really yeah. is, yeah. It's, um okay, I think it's, I'm about to get it, sorry. Okay, the tools of conquest do not necessarily come with bombs and explosions and fallout. There are weapons that are simply thoughts, attitudes, prejudices, to be found only in the minds of men. For the record, prejudices can kill and suspicion can destroy, and a thoughtless, frightened search for a scapegoat has a fallout all its own for the children and the children yet unborn. And the pity of it is that these things cannot be confined to the twilight zone. That's, yeah. I think that's the only time he says, this isn't the twilight zone. This is something outside of it, or, you know, this is, this is just us right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, um, w without, without a doubt, and I, I recall we actually read the teleplay version of that in seventh grade in Syosset, um, Southwood oh. Middle School. Yeah. Uh, and it was before I became a huge Twilight Zone fan, which I am now. You know, the, the Twilight Zone, like everything else, horror as a kid scared me. So I skirted the edges of it. And when my parents were watching it, I would be like outside the door listening because That's I was pulled into it, but at the same time, it was like that connection. If I made that immediate connection and watched it, it was too much. And, um, you know, clearly I've just allowed myself to just be embraced in it um, since. But there was just so much when we read that teleplay. I think that all of us being the age of the main character and being the age of the characters, the, the children, Julia and Good Neighbors, just kind of got we were like ooh, so it, it's you know there's a lot that I think kids pick up on that adults do not yeah well I think um I tried very hard to make my kids uh in good neighbors like real kids and like flawed and confused and like messy and awkward in ways that feel true and like I just, I just watched that movie Ordinary People the other night. And I don't know, if you go back to it, they're such dorky kids. And they, they're like so heartfelt because everything means so much to them. And like, they're just full of love and they're full of life, but they're also inarticulate and they're also spazzy. And they also say really hurtful things to each other in ways that for whatever reason, I think um, American media, uh, has dispensed with, and it doesn't want real kids. It wants sexualized wish fulfillment children that adults will watch and imagine themselves as and have this nostalgic joy from that I think is really damaging and uh, I'm very much against. And yeah. it's also, it's a lie. You watch it and you think, oh, that's what kids are like. And you see it so much that you look at your own kids and you're like, this is weird. My kids are so different from TV kids. And of course they are because TV kids don't exist, but they did. It wasn't always like this. It wasn't always this weird pandering to middle-aged adults. Um, and I think it started with like Dawson's Creek and those TV shows from, and Buffy and those TV shows from the nineties that made these kids small, sexy adults. It's interesting that you mentioned Buffy because I like I think Buffy progressed that way for sure. Um, I'll, like I think though, like one thing about Buffy, and you're talking about awkwardness. I know myself, like Willow, was the character that I saw myself in the most because she was awkward. I mean, she was she was awkward, and she wore sweaters in LA and they were fluffy, and she <laughs> always said the wrong thing. And I think 
that's why so many people, I mean, you know, there was a lot of cool things in Buffy too, and, you know, like fighting monsters, but I think that's why Willow was like the breakout character, because a lot of us geeks who liked things about Buffy saw ourselves in Willow. Now, Xander is a whole other story altogether, and we can't, we do not, this is not what we're talking about. We do not have time to go into the problems with that character. Well, I loved Buffy. I think, uh, but I, especially as it progressed, um, it was messed up. And, and the kinds of things that it was saying were okay and was saying were what 17 year olds and 18 year olds do was right. so dishonest. It was just written by like some horny people, you know? And it was like, don't put that on these kids. It's not fair to them. But but when Write you talk about adult horny book, you know, when you, when you talk about but when you talk about TV kids, and this is kind of going back to what you were talking about and making the kids in your um in your in your book, it makes me think about this is gonna sound ridiculous, possibly. Um Nickelodeon in the 90, 80s and 90s versus now. Nickelodeon in the 80s and 90s, now there were definitely diversity issues in it. Um, although shows like Roundhouse and other shows had, you know, like definitely had a bit more diversity in their casting, but not as much as really should be. But the kids were awkward looking and they weren't like airbrushed. Like think about the adventures of Pete and Pete. Like, would you ever see a cast like that of kids who are messed up running around their suburban neighborhood doing that stuff now? That's actually kind of what I felt like what I was doing when I was watching, like reading about the rat pack of kids in your neighborhood. I love that. I was not allowed to have cable ever. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I have, ca I didn't have, have cable no until idea I was 12. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> I remember like, like, coming up to my dad and being like, I read this article in the Wall Street Journal that they wanna cut prison funding for cable because in America, they spend $2.5 million on cable for prisoners. And I just like to bring up the fact that we don't have cable in our house. <laughs> Brilliant. And he was like, you're ridiculous. So. <laughs> oh but yeah, I mean, I really wanted those kids to be real kids and I would love to, um, I would love to get children back to being represented as actually children. And I think it's, I think it's very corrupting. And, and one of the messages of this book was about the way that media corrupts a story um, and the way that uh, it's driven this corruption by money and yeah. by just getting the purient interest of uh, readers. Or yeah, I, I mean, I loved, I absolutely loved that frame part of it. Um, and I think like, you know, if you have not read this novel yet, it's, it, it really like, it really brings it along kind of as the outside, you know, there's um, a few novels um, that I've read recently that have like, they have use of news clippings and other things to sort of set the mood for the story. And done poorly it could feel superfluous to this it really felt like this futuristic not too distant futuristic situation was being looked at um objectively from you know later on and i i really appreciated that so much um well i thought about um and my husband mentioned this to me in in life you never know what the true story is um even if you have an argument with your spouse and you're like, I didn't say that, you know, a year later and they're like, you did say that, and, you know, it's, it's a mess. Um, but, and then, you know, take that to whatever exponential degree it is trying to figure out what's happening in the political system right now. Um, but I thought it would be really cathartic for a reader to be able to see there's like one thing that happens it's called the maple street massacre and it's a look at how it happened and why it happened and it's sort of an archaeological study of it and then for a reader i thought it it would feel really good to know exactly what the truth is and exactly what everyone's spin on it and why they have that spin and why the media has that spin and then to feel like they know something for absolute fact. And I think when you finish the book, it's a surprise and it, is, it also feels um, whole and complete. 
in a really satisfying way for that reason. I hope. Well, yeah, no, I agree. Um, so are you working on another book at the moment? I am. It's called Mom's Night Out. I just was like typing before we, um, we met up and um, it's due with my editor on January 1st. So <laughs> I'm hoping to get it there. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, we were just talking before this podcast started about like homeschool <laughs> and like having our kids home while working. So it's been, um, been an education in so many ways. Um, but yeah, and then I wanted to address uh, this question of horror because I consider myself a horror writer and I love horror, but I've noticed that uh, when my work is labeled horror, less people buy it. And it's for a couple of reasons. Yes, yes. And one of the reasons is simply that people are turned off by the label and that's not always fair. But the other reason is I think it's especially women who don't buy it. Um, and I think it's because so much of horror involves, um, involves women being harmed and abused in ways that feels like masochism to read. And so I'm okay with not having that horror label because that's not what my book is. My book is like, you know, a Shirley Jackson or it's, it's something that's, you know, not, nobody's getting slashed. There's no joy in the violence. There isn't much explicit violence. And then the other thing is that um, a lot of male readers are, are read horror and some of my stuff turns them off because it's about women. So the, my books didn't sell very well, the first three. And then Simon & Schuster uh, labeled it not as horror and suddenly it was received far better. And I had so many readers who say, I would never read horror, but I read this and I really liked it. Is it horror? And I'm like, if you don't want it to be horror, it's not horror. Like, I don't care just as long as you read it. Um, and it's a strange place to be in. And I think, I think the horror dial is moving right now. When you look at the writers who are on the bestseller list, yeah, I think, um, well, for instance, I mean, I, I shout her name out, um, Becky Spratford, who is um, RA for All. She's really pushing horror um, for Reader's Advisory and for libraries. And just for it to be respected as legitimate literature, I, I, I this makes me sad as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are labeled as thriller that I think are quite horrific and might not have sold as well if people call them horror. But if you do, if you look at the bestseller list, I think that there is a resurgence and there's plenty of reasons for that. I mean, I know myself and others, um, horror has been my pandemic comfort read, but I'm hoping that we're beginning to look beyond genre um, for legitimacy of literature because. I yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm like, oh good. Could we put horror on the label? Cause like people gave me blurbs and I was like, Maybe don't put best horror novel of the year, just, you know, <laughs> put best thriller of the year, you know, like, cause, cause people look at it and they go, I don't want to read that. Mm. I, you know, which isn't, which is ridiculous. Yeah. But, but anyway, Mexican Gothic was great. Stephen Graham Jones has been on the bestseller list and so is Gertie Hendrix. So. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited okay. to share this um, interview and to see what comes next for you, um, please come back and talk to us about your upcoming book. Is it now, is that book going to be horror? Um, they are going to call it something else, yeah. <laughs> probably. But, um, but yeah, yeah. But they might not. I mean, it's just unclear. Right. I, all I know is my last, my third book was horror and it was like four people bought it. Wow. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> So I'm like, whatever name you want to put on it that helps it sell is great. But yeah. All right. Well, once again, this was Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast. Our guest was Sarah Langan. And we are going to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.